Let us worship God, let us pray. How pleased and blessed are we to gather together in thy name this Sunday evening, our merciful and loving Heavenly Father. And so we really honour thee and please thee in our thoughts and actions and our words. So send thy Holy Spirit upon us and into us the gentle dove, or may he spread his wings over us this evening hour, and may we be blessed in our obedience of faith. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let us sing to God's praise. It's 897, if you're using a hymn book, it is a thing most wonderful, almost too wonderful to be. 897.
very good evening, everybody, and a very warm and sincere welcome to you all in the name of our risen Saviour. To all of those here in the building and to those who are meeting to worship with us online. Our preacher this evening, again, is the Reverend Jeff Thomas. And Jeff, we're very grateful to you for coming to us. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to you opening God's word to us very soon now. Notices for the week are as follows. We're still in the summer holiday recess, so many of our midweek meetings are currently suspended. The Grove Chapel pop-up cafe will be held again on Wednesday morning from 10 until 12. Anyone from the church who wants to come and support the cafe would be very welcome. Uh, it has been a very encouraging endeavor that the last few weeks we've seen some very interesting contacts and conversations made through that work and we pray God will continue to use that. We're meeting for prayer in the rear hall here and on Zoom at eight o'clock on Wednesday evening. Next Sunday at, on the 28th, we will be meeting for worship at 11 and 6.30, when God willing, in the morning, Tim Whitten from East Street Baptist Church will be preaching here, but Paul, our pastor, will be preaching at East Street. Uh, and Paul will be back with us in the evening to preach here. There is a memorial service for our brother David Mitchell, which will be held here in the chapel at 12.45 on Wednesday the 7th of September, which is open to everyone. And an advance notice that there's a training session for the Welcome Boxes Outreach, which will be held online and in the chapel on Monday, September the 19th. This session is open to anybody who wants to support the work of Welcome Boxes, but it's also very helpful for anybody who just wants to know more about the situation of refugees arriving and living in the UK. Please do remember all these activities in your prayers as much as you can. Uh, three of our younger folk are going away to university in the new term, uh, and there are boxes in the lobby where you can leave small gifts for them to help them settle into their new studies. Uh, if you look at what's already in the boxes, it will give you a clue as to the kind of thing that will be useful. Now let's turn to God in prayer. We come to our Father's God, the rock of our salvation, the rock that is so strong, so mighty, so steadfast and certain. Lord, our God, we turn to you again to praise you and to worship you, the God who is both our creator, our judge, and our savior. Lord God, how we bless you and praise you that our eternal future is in your hands. We thank you that salvation is of the Lord. We thank you that the Lord Jesus was able to say, even as he hung dying upon the cross, it is finished. It is done. It's complete. There is no more to be done. All those who look to you, Lord, shall be saved and saved to the uttermost. Lord God, how we thank you that this depends entirely upon you and not on us. For Lord, when we look at our own lives, we know how far short we fall of your holy laws. And Lord God, it is all the more terrible, Lord, because those laws are good. Lord, as we heard this morning, you are good. And everything you do is for our benefit. And the laws that you set out, you set out for our good as well as for your own glory. And yet, Lord, as, as a nation and as a people and as individuals, we have rebelled against you. We have turned away from you, Lord. And we, we who are here this evening worshiping you, Lord, we are here alone because the Lord Jesus Christ intervened in our lives in the same way that he did for Saul of Tarsus. Lord, if you had not stopped us in our tracks, if you had not called us and drawn us, where would we be? 
And despite your grace, Lord God, we still sin day in and day out. We constantly lose sight of who you are and of your all that you have done for us. My Lord, we pause now and we just pray, Lord, that you will look down upon us. And Lord, in mercy, we pray that you will accept our repentance. Lord, we pray that you will accept our prayers. Lord, we we know that you have promised in your word that all those who confess their sins and turn to you will be saved, that they will be restored, that they will be blessed. Lord God, we thank you for the work that's been going on over the summer, the various outreach meetings that have been taking place. Lord, we think especially of the, the camps and the beach missions that have been going on. Lord, we lift these things up to you. We pray, Lord, that you will richly bless this work. Lord, we are a very, very needy people. Lord, these, these camps are, are, have the potential under your hand to be such a huge blessing, Lord, if your spirit will take and own that work. And Lord, we, we pray that you will bless these meetings, Lord. We know even now that there are meetings with the United Beach Missions taking place in Scarborough. Lord God, we pray that your spirit would visit that work. We pray, Lord, that your word would be opened. We pray that the people who are, are leading at those camps and speaking at them and interacting with the children there, Lord, we do pray that they will be greatly enabled and blessed. Lord, we pray that you will work mightily through these things. Lord, we ask you to bless the younger generations in our land, Lord. We, we are asking for the things that we do not deserve, Lord, because we have brought these things upon ourselves. We've turned away from your standards. But Lord God, we pray that you will have mercy on the young, Lord. There are so many things in the media and in the world of entertainment and in, in even in the world of education, Lord, those who should be teaching these children and, and showing them the right paths and the right way are actually teaching them things that are leading them away from you. Lord God, there is only one solution for this, Lord, that you would come down and act, that you would lay bare your arm. Lord God, we look around the world and we see so many different challenges in different places. Lord, there are wars, there are famines, and there are economic crises, and there are so many other things going on. Lord God, when we look at all this, we remember that you are enthroned in the heavens, that you are still completely and utterly and totally in command, and you always will be. Lord God, we pray that you would give our leaders in this country wisdom to turn and look at the problems that this country faces, Lord, in a, in, a, in a manner that will be pleasing to you. Lord, we know that you hold men's hearts in your hands. We pray that you will work in, in those in government in, in this country and that you will bring them to, to do the right thing. Lord, we, we long to see people in government who are truly believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for those who are there. And Lord, we pray for our royal family too, that as our queen has followed you and worshipped you and believed you and trusted you, Lord, we pray that there will be many more members of the family, Lord, that you will, in your righteous, holy power, turn to yourself. Our God, we pray for the missionaries that we support as a church. Lord, we think especially of Emmendel and of Beth. Lord, we pray you will bless them. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the work that Dave and Mary have been doing. Our Lord, we thank you for the bowls. Lord, we pray you will be with them and that you will guide them as to their future. Lord God, in all these things, we look to you. Lord, whatever problems we see, and there are so many problems in life, we have a great high priest. We have a mighty king. We have that strong city, the city of God. The city that is strong because God is that God of that city. Dear Lord, we pray now that as we turn to your word again, Lord, that you will work very, very greatly through it. We pray that your spirit would take the preaching 
and use it for your glory and for the good of our souls. Lord, forgive our many sins and bless us, we pray. All of this because we ask it alone in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our reading is uh, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, and we'll start to read at verse 11, Luke chapter 15 and, and verse 11. Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. He was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. No one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired Servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you are no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. May God bless the reading of his holy and infallible word. And now we'll sing a hymn written by an American in Princeton Seminary 200 years ago, O Sacred Head, So Wounded, number 356 in your hymnal if you're using it.
Let's look at this passage that's so familiar to you all, that's been read in your hearing, Luke chapter 15 and verses 11 to 24. Um, a man had two sons. You know the story so well. He's addressing the different groups of people. They like football crowds are uh, segregated. The um, visitors and the home teams supporters. So they, they weren't fused together in, in any way. They weren't intermingling. They were the Pharisees and they were the sinners of the land, contemptuous of one another, irreligious, careless, breakers of God's law, and then the Pharisees, who were teachers of the law and its multitudinous precepts. No love lost between them. And so our Lord, he He's addressing both these groups of men in what he does. Um, Pharisaic hypocrisy and human guilt and shame. And he tells them this message of the incredible grace of God to repentant sinners. It was relevant to both parties. Um, you may think it's very familiar in I hope you've heard it many times, but that Jesus will continue to just help you and help me as I bring um, its truth to you. It's an oral portrait of uh, God's redemption, and it has its own validity, its own finality. It's more accurate and more moving and even more profound than a series of propositions which Jesus also gave and which the Apostle gives in his uh, letters. Um, the picture he paints is very evocative and open-ended, and you know it sticks in your memory, doesn't it? Uh, after all the explanations we preachers make have, have come to an end and are forgotten, the story we will fall back on um, will live, and I want it to live in your minds for the rest of the week, of an old man running to kiss and hug his child before the child changes its mind and turns away. I have three hours. Um, the three hours of education, you know, well, there are three hours to this story too. And uh, first hour is of the rebellion of, of this boy, this lad went to his uh, landowning father one evening and he said to him, give me. And he didn't say, give me a coat of many colors. And he didn't say, give me a white stallion. But he said that he wanted that portion of goods that, that was his, his share, his legal share of the estate he'd passed in age limit, I suppose, of 18, and it was legally his right. And then getting it passed to his older brother. He then would turn that share that he received into cash. He would have the land valued and the crops and herds valued, and then he would sell his share off to someone else and that would bring great shame to be added to the shame that his son had already brought, which would be the talk of, of the countryside round about who knew and esteemed this family very well. It was the equivalent of saying to his father, I wish you were dead. And the father bore these two blows without recrimination to this day, there are people in various cultures that find this story incredible. I have a friend who works in a part of London, which is multiracial, and he meets with the men on a Friday night, and they, they play ping pong and so on, and uh, pool. And then he tells them a Bible story. And he told them this story from Luke 15. And he said to them, what would happen if a son came to his father in, in the country from which you and your family have come? What would be the father's response? 
and they looked to one another and they nodded and their spokesman said he'd kill his son. Fathers don't behave like this father behaved. Um, there's grace then right at the beginning when he agrees to his son's request and halves the farm and gives the contents to this rebel boy. You know there are people who uh, come to London all the time and look for, for work here. Hundreds every month come here from a rural village. They want to make their fortune. Um, in that country, what this boy had done would be shameful because he was abandoning his obligation to care for his father in old age as his father had cared for him in the first uh, 16, 18 years of his life. So the son got together all he had. He put it in a bag. He kept it somehow safe. And he was leaving home. He had no pleasure in the company of his father and his brother. And he proceeded to put as many miles as possible between his old homestead and himself. He found the old life restricting. It was suffocating. It was narrow. And he was heading for a place that was a long way away from where he'd been raised. He went through a country to get to the country. It was a distant, it was a far country. And he chose the life of paganism over the privileges of living in the promised land. He turned his back on the covenant people of God. Just like people who leave us then, he wanted to have nothing to do with that lifestyle and those values. He wanted no reminders of God. And it's an illogical step to take because you know how it Two o'clock in the morning, you can wake up and you can feel the sadness and you can feel the need. The omnipresent God has just given you a nudge at that time. He's, he's everywhere. Well, in that uh, new country, the boy made new friends. He spoke another language. He picked up new habits, new attitudes to the seasons of the year, he wore a different style of clothing. I've got away from all that I was, he said. I hated it so much. Nobody knows me here, and uh, I can do whatever I want to do without any comments, without anyone's disapproval, without a tut-tut from mum or dad or anyone's frown. And he answered to no man, and then he gave in to the forbidden pleasures that he couldn't imagine doing while living at home. You understand, it was not when he got there he could go to 21st birthday parties. It wasn't that. Or that he could go to weddings when he went to the distant country. Jesus himself went to weddings and he went to feasts. But this man was unrestrained in his sensuality and his spendthrift extravagance. And his motto was spend, spend, for tomorrow we die. And so very quickly, there was a new kid on the block. Have you heard? The new kid, he's got money. And so he gathered a host of fair weather friends. And every itch was scratched and every appetite was satisfied. And he deprived himself of no new sensation. Um, he sowed to the flesh. He thought, ah, this is the abundant life. And he never lacked companionship because there were hunting trips that he took his friends on. And there were great feasts. And there was free wine. And there were women to buy. And the money went remarkably quickly. His father's inheritance just vanished. One day he went to the bag. There were a few coins left. And he was far from home. Everybody's got an auntie living in London. 
And when we come to a conference, then we ask Auntie if we can stay with her. We've got friends, but he had no friends. It was a far country and no savings. And all his buddies had just dropped him. And then there was a recession. A fierce drought. Dust everywhere. Unemployment everywhere. People coming in from the villages which were just barren, hoping that there would be food or work in the city. The boom had become burst. And he was alone. And he was confronted with the reality of a groaning world and living under the curse. But then things got even worse. The only job he could get was working with pigs. And pigs were unclean to any Jew. And he went even worse. He got so hungry there. The pittance that the man gave him, the pig farmer gave to him, he, he put his hand in the trough where the pigs ate, and he would eat the pods, chew the pods that the pigs ate. Sin is a hard master to serve. He was in bondage to poverty among the pigs. What began as one thrill after another ended in serfdom. He was like um, a party drinker who becomes a drunk. He was like a drug addict, a drug user who becomes an addict. He was like a promiscuous person who gets a sexually transmitted disease. The party had become a prison. And this is what sin does if you allow it to continue as your, as your master. You're seeing the depths then that this boy went to. There's no redeeming feature uh, about him, no comment on saying, well, he was a nice fellow. I'm sure he was. But from that time when he asked his father for his inheritance and set off, he ends up in a field of pigs. Now, we can allegorize this, this parable. And then we'd make a mistake. We could say the prodigal son is the sinner. That he's a type of everyone who is away from God. And then before we know it, we're saying to every teenager and every man and woman and middle-aged ladies of the utmost decorum, we're saying to them, there you are with your pigs and prostitutes, squandering all that your loving Father has given to you. That is not the message of this parable. This boy is not every man. This is not your run-of-the-mill sinner. This is not uh, the proper people of Camberwell at all. This is how he is described in the parable. This fellow is a rake. This fellow is a fool. He's a drunkard, a waster, a derelict. This guy is a heartbreaker. That's what he is. He doesn't stand as a symbol of the ordinary people that are in school with us or that we meet when we're talking on the doors to people, the people we'll see at work tomorrow, he's not like that. This is the sinner in the pits. This is as far as you can go, as low as you can fall. He's in the gutter on the waterfront. Soho, death row. He's the extreme. He's thrown out of low company. If there ever was a son who would say, a father would say to him, don't bother to come back. If there ever was a sinner that God would reject, it would be this man, this Saul of Tarsus, this Gadarene demoniac, this Jesus hater, this John Newton, this suicide bomber, this policeman who handcuffs a woman and rapes her and kills her and burns her body. 
not an ordinary sinner. This man is on the lowest rung of the ladder. He's an inch above the surface of the cesspit. And he's sinking, and he's sinking and sinking. You can think of the angels, and Gabriel and Michael are, are talking together. They're looking at this scene in, in wonder. And Gabriel says to Michael, um, is this the worst you've ever seen? All these privileges contemptuously rejected. Uh, was King Saul worse than this? Was the Gadarene demoniac worse than this? Uh, is he worse than Saul of Tarsus in his cruelty? Will our Lord receive him? Surely he's gone over the line, hasn't he? It means that you and I can never think that uh, someone as bad as me for such a long time and repeatedly, there's uh, no way we can be saved. We think we're unique in our shame. We're so extraordinary, so guilty, so abandoned that there's no hope for us. And yet, here we meet the worst possible scenario, the most abandoned of men, the most selfish, this heartbreaker, this family breaker, this hopeless person. And yet there's a road back from exactly where he was in the field of pigs. There was a road back all the way to where God is. So whatever, whatever your abandonness and hypocrisy and intellectual arrogance and pain... There's a road, there's a highway for you to the Father. So that's the first thing I want you to say, the rebellion of the Son, the first R. The second R is the repentance of the Son. And there's a theme that runs through this chapter. The theme is not that God rejoices in sinners, that's not the theme. It is that God rejoices in sinners who turn. Sinners who repent. It's there in verse 7 and it's there again in verse 10. Well, that's a word. Three syllables. Repentance. What, what does it mean? And the answer is here most beautifully in the parable of the prodigal son. What happened to him? Well, two or three things happened to him. Firstly, verse 17, he came to himself. He came to his senses. He saw what he'd done. He realized where his life was at the moment. He knew where he was at. He was far from home. He was penniless. He was homeless and hopeless and disgraced and discredited and abandoned. And he came to himself. He came to his senses. Not the typical sinner, but the worst sinner. But it is undeniable that the journey to God begins when we face up to who we are and what we are, to our own condition. Maybe our sin is notorious. And then one day we see it and we are aghast at the wickedness. You'd have thought that this, this boy would have been for weeks, months, ever since he plucked up courage to go to his father and demand his lot. You, you look at some people, you know, the the streets of London. We stop sometimes. We can't give to all the beggars that stopped us tonight on the way here at the car and asked for money. It's, it's a great moral problem. You don't want to show hardness to anyone. We generally stop and talk to the women that are there. I was passing last week a, a woman and a police a policewoman was there. She had a notepad and she was asking her name and address. She was about 17. She was on the streets begging. She was just an ordinary 
she didn't look anything but an, an ordinary teenager. There was a girl we always stopped by the dry cleaners in Turnham Green, and uh, we, we talked to her. What uh, struck us about her was that uh, she was always reading, and that, that gave us much pleasure. I talked to her one day, and then I went down to the Oxfam shop. And I looked in the religious section, and I found a book called The Prodigal God, uh, Tim Keller's book. I didn't know it, but I knew it would be a, a gospel book. So I bought it, two ninety nine. They all are in Oxfam. And I went back and I said, oh, here's a book for you. You might enjoy reading this. Oh, thank you, she said, and she took the book. And a few days later, we came back and talked to her again. How are you getting on with the book, I said to her. He had an older brother, she said to me. She'd read it. And the story had just leaped out at her. But there are other people that we meet. And we think they must know about themselves. They have to know. The alcoholic has to know. The paedophile, the drug addict must be aware of what, what he's doing to himself, or what he's doing to his family. He must know. Surely he has come to his senses, but you find in the Old Testament that that wasn't the case. That um, he is King David, and he's reprehensible in what he's done. He's taken a young man's wife, and he's impregnated her, and then he's decided he'd kill the young man and he can keep her. How awful. And yet he seems to have gone on for weeks and months and months without, without doing a thing about it, without losing a night's sleep, and that God has to send a, a, a servant of his to speak to him, a prophet, Nathan, and he tells him a story and he lays it on him. He says to him, you are the man. You are the man who's offended God so much. You, you are. How many people today and their sin is staring them in their face, but they don't come to their senses. They're, they're on the edge of eternity. It's appointed unto us. That's one day, our last breath. One day. What have we got? The remnants of our life are we built up a little cash in the bank and we paid our mortgage off. We've got some family, some memories. We haven't come to our senses. We haven't looked at ourselves in the light of the God who made us and the God who has blessed and helped us through our lives. What we have is vanity of vanities. That all is vanity. We have our goals and our objectives and our chief ends. John Milton, you know, um, at that moment when a person thinks he's got it all then, Milton says, come the blind furies with their abhorred shears and they slit the fine spun thread. What have we got? You know, the great politicians of the last century. Winston Churchill, Harold Wilson, Ronald Reagan, in their declining years, the ego-reinforcing attainments of their lives, enormously influential figures with applauds and accolades of continents. And yet in their final years, what did they have? didn't know their wives, didn't know themselves, didn't know anything about what they'd done in their lives. 
Repentance begins when the person comes to himself, when he comes to his senses, when he looks at his, her life and sees the shadowlands of living in God's world without God. And there's self-evaluation. The gospel isn't a call to fantasy, is it? The gospel says, here's this figure. This preacher of the Sermon on the Mount. This beautiful person who could pray for those that were nailing him to the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The one who rose from the dead on, on the third day. And you look at yourself in the light of him. That's the first thing of what repentance is. And the second thing is that he remembered his father. The known father is just once in the parable so far. And then in the next six verses from 17 onwards, seven times, father. What about his father? What about his father? The Shorter Catechism tells us that repentance begins with an apprehension of the mercy of God. You know that? What is saving repentance? When a person apprehends the mercy of God, you start to think, ah, I've messed up. God could never be merciful to me. But then you're given some hope because you think of, oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus, oh, the vastness. Who is a pardoning God like him? Who is there? It might be a glimmer. It might be a maybe, but some encouragement. Look, think. He could welcome you back, you back. He could. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Sinners, Jesus will receive. Sound the word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leave. All who linger, all who fall, sing it all. And or again, Christ receives sinful men and women. What had caused this decision? I, I'm, I'll go home to Dad. What caused this? Well, somewhere in his upbringing, they had been implanted indelibly in his consciousness that when things went wrong, he could always go home. He could always come back. He hadn't been told, if you bring disgrace on the family, never come back. He hadn't been conditioned to, if you let us down, don't bother to come back. If you bring shame on our name, stay away. He'd been told, and this truth was lived out in the practice of his father, his father's whole attitude to him at the time when he was asking for his share. However low you go, however deep the abyss, however appalling the degradation, you must always remember, son, this is your home. And here you can return. And I would beg and plead with all the parents that they give their children the same utmost and unconditional security. That your children know that if they face the ultimate in tragedy, they can still come home. If they become alcoholics, they can come home. If they marry the wrong people, they can come home. If they get sexually transmitted disease, they can still come home. If they get pregnant, they can come home. If they have an abortion, they can come home. If they end up in jail, when they come out, they come home. They must have, they need to have that assurance. It's one of the most basic elements of biblical pedagogy. And that's how God trains his children. He wants them to exemplify his fatherhood and the way he deals so patiently and lovingly and forgivingly with us that we deal in the same way with our children. That's repentance. It's turning from 
the mess and it's a turning to him. And then um, he came with an imperfect repentance, an imperfect faith, didn't he? Uh, we, we don't say you've got to really believe now, really, 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 100% faith, 100% repentance. He said, now, I'm going to meet Dad. I've messed up. Dad's going to be angry with me and he's going to look at me. What are you doing here? He'll say, what will I say? And then he, he works out what he's going to say. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I'm not worthy to be called your child. So make me as one of your hired servants. That's what I'll say, won't I? And as he walked slowly down the road, which he'd walked up so expectantly just months before, he went over his speech. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. I can never be a member of his family again, he thought. He brought his father down. He, he can't accept me as his child again. He didn't see that his father was the epitome of grace and mercy and love. He brought him down and he said, well, perhaps he'll take me on um, autumn time when it's harvest and the unemployed will wait in the great market square and the foreman comes for dad and the foreman says, I'll take you and you and you to work for this wage and that you take me on, a hired, a hired man. That's what he looked for. This boy couldn't believe the boy who'd seen his father for 18 years and knew something of his integrity and his kindness and patience and graciousness. This boy couldn't believe that he could be forgiven and welcomed back home. You understand, I'm not saying to you, you know, if you, from where you've fallen that you've got a long way to go and you've got to be absolutely straight. You've got to have great trust in God and great, real repentance and sorrow for what you've done. It's not like that. You take the pebble of repentance and the pebble of faith and you look at it and you look to God and say, I have got much to offer you, Lord. I've just messed up. Be kind, be merciful to me. And lastly, we see here the return of the son, don't we? We've seen his rebellion, and we've seen his repentance, and finally we see his return. He finally makes it to the top of the hill, and he looks down, and there's the farm, the white farm, where he grew up as a boy, and all the fun, the festivals, and work there with dad and mum and his brother. And he hesitates. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me as one. And he, he begins slowly to, to walk back. He's dreading what the response of his father might be. Many times every day, the father went over to the window and pulled the curtain aside and looked up the lane, looked up that road, looked if he'd see a silhouette and the strut that only his youngest son had. And he looked. There was never anyone there. But that morning when he opened the curtain and looked up, there was somebody there, slowly moving. 
can it be my, my boy? He gets out of his chair and he goes to the farmhouse door and he crosses the yard and he stands in, in the country lane and he looks up. It's, it's my boy. It's my boy. And he starts to walk and, and he starts to run. Be careful, old man, running with your brittle bones. Slow down, old man, but he won't slow down because his son might change his mind and he might turn his back and he'd lose him again. And he runs and runs and comes up to him and his son is looking in amazement at this father with a delight on his face. And he wraps his arms around him and he hugs him and he wets his face with the tears that are streaming down the old man's face. Son, son you're home, son, you're home. I'll never let you go again, son. And then three breathless servants turn up and he looks at them and he says, son, you know the best robe, it's in the wardrobe in our bedroom, go and bring it here. And, and the sandals, they're on the floor of the wardrobe. And then the others. Um, the ring, the ring of sonship, the ring is, um, it's in the chest of drawers in the living room. Second drawer down on the left, you'll find the box with the ring in it. Bring it here. And the, the third boy, he says, uh, now we know why we've been fattening the calf. Uh, Organise the party. Get the band together. Tell the women it's a, a day off. We're going to have a feast. My son, he was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. And he's found. And the boy says, well, now, um, do, do you want to talk about this? Father, I've sinned against you. I, I, I'm not worthy to be called your son. Cuts him down. Cuts him down. Doesn't say to him, don't you know what disgrace you brought on our family? Don't you know the anxiety you caused your mother? Don't you know what, you, what we felt when you went away? You, you, you never got in touch with us. Nothing of that at all. There's the smell of roasted veal soon in the air and banjos are being tuned and bagpipes and the men are coming from the distant fields and they're coming and they're cleaning the yard out for the dance, the country dancing because this boy was lost and he's found. The joy of restoration. Now, let me close by putting that joy into words. It's speaking of the great welcome that God gives to his own returning children. The joy he expresses, that he confers upon them. He gives them all their need at the moment of conversion. He gives them all their need they need then. He begins immediately to work all things together for their good. He begins immediately to supply all their needs according to his riches in Jesus Christ. So they can't say, but I couldn't ever live like mum. I could never live like dad. And here is God's grace in their lives. He freely pardons all our sins. He clothes us in robes of righteousness. He rejoices and he says, oh, we're going to rejoice one day when you get to, when you get to heaven. And there was sin on this boy's face, he changed. Father doesn't mention it. God doesn't say, now then, let's talk about this. 
God doesn't do that. He forgives. He freely pardons. And we are cleaned up, whiter than snow. At once we are made sons. It's not five years you live above the barn in the flat there. And then we'll have a family conflab with your older brother and we'll decide whether you're given the blessings of sonship. It's not like that. It's never like that with one of us. It's immediately the robe and immediately the sandals and immediately the ring and the feast. This man had walked all the way home and he hoped to be a servant and he discovers he's an heir, a son. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Father, I, I can't make it. I've let you down once, I'll let you down again. I might disgrace you. All you need, I will give you. Everything you need in every trial, in every temptation, in every fall, in every picking of you up. We come so tremulously, we've got nothing to give. But God has everything to give us. So let me end then. What happened? How did all this be resolved? The boy came to himself. He made a decision. I will set out and go back to my father. No one ever became a Christian who didn't make a decision. I want you to make a decision today, tonight, now, all of you, every one of you. I want you to make a decision. I'm going to my father. Make up your minds now. The prodigal son was transformed. His recovery was achieved when he came to himself. When he saw what he was. And he remembered his father's mercy. And he made a decision. Everything else would be futile. But then he acted on it. He didn't say goodbye to the pigs. He turned his back on them. And he began the journey home. And he kept going. And he kept going. Some of you have come to decisions, but then you've said, but not yet. What saved this boy? Well, two things saved him. Firstly, the immense love and mercy and grace of his father saved him. What saved this boy? He made a decision. I will go home. They're both there. Let's come to ourselves. Let's appreciate once again the wonderful mercy of God in sending his son. That if we trust in him, if our faith is as fine as a spider's thread, but it is joined to Jesus Christ, that faith will take us through life, it will take us into eternity, it will take us over the bottomless pit, it will take us over the lake of fire, it will present us faultless before him. In the great day, we often say it's not great faith that saves. It's the great Savior who saves through faith in him. Make the journey now. No more putting it off. Come now. He's, he's here. You can't escape from the providence of God, can you? The providence of God is that I should come here twice today. And I shall preach to you this morning and preach to you again this evening and lay this word on your conscience and on your minds and on your hearts. 
what God has, has done in his love for the congregation at Grove Chapel. And may you have uh, grace from the same God to respond in wonder to such love. Our Heavenly Father, do bless your word to us tonight now. Ah, bring forth in all our hearts a new spirit of understanding. Help us to come to ourselves. Help us to turn from the vain world's golden store of false promises. And help us to put our trust in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one eternal, loving, living God, who has brought us here in mercy tonight to hear that there's grace even for me. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Come, let us to the Lord our God. In contrite hearts return. That's the um, him we're going to close our singing with this evening. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen.